11, uh, verse 1, and I'll stop you here. Uh, I tell you what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to release you to at least go down through verse 5. <laughs> now when they drew near Jerusalem and came to Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which is spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, lowly and sitting on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. Okay, uh, just a couple of quick notes here that it, you, you can go back and reread this and think about it. But the, the, one of the main points of this text here is Jesus told them to go get the donkey and the colt, and nobody resisted them. It shows the power of God's Word. When you and I, and it's going to get more intense as we go through this text, but with different things that Jesus is teaching us, but when you and I do what He says do, the result is always positive. I remember when, years ago when I learned in prayer school at, at Agape Faith Church, it was it was mind boggling when I first heard it. The the Pastor Susan and and Judy Hall was teaching it, and they said this statement. I was like, you know, you ever had your mind just kind of go tilt because it went against everything I'd ever heard, but it also was confirmed in the Word. They said, "Quit taking God your list. Go to God and get His list." Wow. And then Jesus confirms that throughout the word. He said, I don't do anything unless I see my father doing it. What did he have? 100% success. Now, I'm not saying we can be Christ. We're not. I'm not saying that we won't miss it because we will. But the reality of it is when we hear from God and respond to that word, there's results. Amen. The lady crying on the phone really touched. Why? Because you responded to the word. It's amazing what happens. He said, go tell them. And if anybody asks you, just tell them the Lord has need of them. Wow. And people say, well, that's almost like taking a man's... Mm, yeah, it would be if you didn't create it all and own it all. Right. He's God. That's like when we return the tithe to him. It's not ours. It's his. Yeah. We're just giving back his, the part he asked for. I'm not paying him anything. I'm returning back to him what already belongs to him. Now he's going to take what I steward, the other 90% and going to make it so much better than 100%. Right. Amen. And so he told them to do that. And then uh, Matthew is the only one that quotes it quite like this, the donkey and the colt. Is the, um, Matthew is quoting verbatim uh, uh, Zechariah 9.9. 9. Um, the other Gospels don't. It, it's not, not a big deal. It's just Matthew was, was making sure that he covered the prophecy. It was a, don a donkey and the colt. And what was Jesus doing? He was doing exactly what the prophecy said he would do. Why? He heard from God. He knew what to do. He knew what the Word said. He was the Word. There again, you, when we put... People say, well, what's the Word of faith that you talk about? It's taking this... It's real simple. It takes this and puts it above every circumstance in your life. It's not, about, it's not about a sign. It's not about a confirmation. What's God say? If God says you're healed, just believe that. If God says you're prosperous, and he does, just believe that. And so the, he came. And, and the other thing, and we'll move on, uh, the other thing about riding on the colt and the donkey is it showed, it showed his humanity. It showed him as a humble servant. In Philippians, it talks about in chapter 2 how he left, the, he left heaven and he, he didn't count that. He just humbled himself. He was the Son of God, but he humbled to the, the will of God. He'd done the things that, uh, that God told him to do. Why? Because he, he was going to conquer sin by obedience, not just by being the Son of God. Why? Because that way we know how to conquer things. We have a high priest that's been touched by the feelings of our infirmities. So Jesus, no, we can never technically say nobody knows how we feel. Right. We've all done it. 
But Jesus knows how you feel. And see, that, that's so cool because think about it. You're never alone. As a Christian, you're never alone. You may feel lonely at times, and I, I, I encourage you with this. If you ever do, and as I myself would ever feel lonely, is, is just go hang out with Jesus. You won't feel lonely no more. Amen. Just a simple prayer sometimes. I was praying this morning over my breakfast, and I was like, and I opened my eyes, and all of a sudden, and I mean, I mean, we all pray all the time. And I opened my eyes, and I was like, wow. Wow. I was just talking to God before I eat oatmeal. And I mean, I know we know that, but sometimes we forget the power we have in prayer. I was praying for you. I wasn't praying just for the oatmeal. I was praying for you. I was praying for this service. Why? Because it was on God's mind. We pray. We don't go to him for a list. We go to him and he gives us the list. And if God gives you the list, he'll complete it. Amen. Why are people so stressed out in the world today? They haven't bothered to find out what God wants. They just want to know what their neighbor expects of them sometimes or what somebody else expects of them. Don't fall into that trap. Find out what God wants from you because it's never heavy. He said, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. I hold him to it all the time. Sometimes people will try to put things. Oh, you're a pa you say, they find out I'm a pastor. And they'll say, oh, bless your heart. Ooh, bless your heart. And I'm like, please don't put that on me. I'm good. I'm good. God told me to do this. Why would I not be good? My wife said, you shouldn't really say that. I, I used to say this. She's not here. So <laughs> don't tell her. <laughs> when I accepted the call to pastor this church, I felt like I'd retired. Why? Because his yoke is easy. His burden is light. Now, I'm not going to tell you I had not had no bad days. Life will throw them at you. But comparative to anything prior to that, it's been wonderful. You make it wonderful showing up. You make it wonderful. We had, I don't know how many people in here yesterday that serve and had a meeting, and I, I, I look at all of them, and I'm like, they're the one. And I, my job is to help them make it easy to do what God's told them to do. Working together in a vision for God. Amen? And that's what these disciples were doing. They, they walked away with the colt and donkey. You never, hear anybody about, you never hear anything about somebody coming after them and saying, hey, bring me my donkey back. Why? Because God told them that was their list and God will fulfill what it, whatever you... This is, this is why it's so important to be in church and get a word from God. Why? When God gives you a word, you hold on to it. You say, what if I miss it? He'll tell you. You'll know it. But he won't beat you up. Right. No, he's not into that. There's no condemnation to those that are in Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay. Romans 8 1. Go ahead and let's read down to verse 11. So the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. They brought the donkey and the colt, laid their clothes on them, and set him on them. And a great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then the, the multitudes who went before them and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? So the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. This is one of the only times recorded, and we celebrate it on Palm Sunday, but this is one of the only times recorded in the, in the uh, Gospels where all of a sudden the, the, the people on earth begin to give all glory to God. They're worshiping Him as the Messiah. They, they really believed, here comes our Savior. I don't have time to teach on all of it. As we go through, we'll, we'll hit it more and more, but just be aware of this. These are the, some of the same people that got it twisted, and within a few days, they're crying out, crucify. There's a great life lesson here. It, we have to continue to worship the Lord. If we don't, we'll become critical of the Lord. We'll begin to blame God for things that really, if we'll just stop and do a little self-evaluation sometimes, we'll realize we didn't follow 
what the Lord said. We don't beat ourselves up. Why? There's no condemnation in him. But we and then sometimes we just realize that this is just an attack of the enemy. This is just too silly, too goofy. I haven't done anything but worship the Lord here, and this is happening it, out of nowhere. And then you realize and you start rebuking him in that situation rather than evaluating yourself. Know how to fight. A good soldier knows how to fight. And how does a soldier fight? They find out, they get the handbook, and they learn how to fight. Calling those things that be not as if they were. Bringing, casting down every high thought that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. They did not know that. They, they were worshiping him at this moment, giving all glory to God, and then by the end of the week, they're saying crucify him. And we'll see why that, I will give you, I'll let this out. Why was that? And remember this, this is a very important point about our walk with the Lord. Why did they turn so quickly? Because Jesus, the bottom line was Jesus did not do what they were anticipating him do, to do. They were anticipating he's coming into Jerusalem. He's going to set up his kingdom, overthrow the Roman government, and we're good. And that did not happen. It did happen, but it happened spiritually, and there's a day coming where every king, every person will bow at the name of Jesus. Amen. It did happen. It just didn't happen the way they seen it with their eyes. Again, they took their list instead of getting his. And that will always bring confusion. Uh, go ahead and uh, let's see, read down to verse 17. Then Jesus went into the temple of God and drove out all those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. Then the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. But when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did and the children crying out in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant and said to him, do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, yes. Have you never read out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants you have perfected praise? Then he left them and went out of the city to Bethany, and he lodged there. Okay, so so here's a here's a great life lesson that Jesus. Let me tell you about my Jesus. Here's a great life lesson. Don't believe the press. Believe Jesus. They were praising him. Now it would be so easy for him as a person because he was all God, but he was also all man. Over and over you'll see in the New Testament, the Son of God, the Son of Man, the Son of God, the Son of Man. What was it? He got tired. He got hungry. He got angry. He, he showed his humanity, even though he was God, the Word became flesh and he dwelt among us. If you miss that, you'll always struggle with victory. Yeah. Let me say that again. If you miss that, you'll struggle with victory because here's what we will say. Well, he was God. That's why he could do it. We've all been guilty of saying it. You have the victory in him. Paul said it this way. I believe, therefore I speak. What do you speak? Whatever the Bible says. But if you fall into that trap that the enemy has set to say, yeah, but you know, you pastors saying we can speak this and have this, but that was God doing it. Well, God's doing it in you. Only difference is he's using a different vehicle. Same God, same voice. He hadn't changed. And so he's doing this. Jesus went in the temple and drove them out. He's turning tables over. One of the Gospels even says he, he um, made a whip, <laughs> premeditated. <laughs> premeditated. He, he, he didn't fly off the handle. No. He got angry, but he didn't sin because that's what he told us to do. There's some things you need to get angry about. There's times, you, as in the South, we used to say, there's times when you need to put your foot down. There's times where it is okay to have holy indignation. 
We don't believe the press. Everybody telling you to go one way. What's God telling you? And that's the key. What is God telling you? And so Jesus turned this over. So the question comes up to me, why? Why did he do this? Well, real simple. He said his house should be a house of prayer. What were they doing? You have to know a little bit about the history uh, of of the text to know what they were doing. And there's been some written about it, like Josephus and some of the historians. But what they were actually doing is taking sacrifices to all the people that's coming in to that uh, uh, holy week. They're taking the sacrifices and they're charging inflated prices to the people coming into the temple. They also say that not only were they doing that, is they were coming in from all other places and they were actually, uh, you had to exchange the cash or, or the silver, whatever you had for temple tokens, if you will. And that's how they paid for this stuff. Well, the, the exchange rate, they were lying about it too. Jesus nailed it. They become a den of thieves. Now, some have took this so literal that you could never have a a yard sale or a bake sale in the church. No, that's not what he's talking about at all. He's talking about don't misuse the kingdom to get your way. That's what they were doing. Businessmen always pay attention to this. Don't ever use Christ and ride his coattail to prosper. Just believe he blesses you. If someone asked you, be that light, be that salt, but don't you to, don't use it as leverage. Why? Well, one, it's usually going to end up with egg in your face. I've known people in business for years. They, if they seen a fish on a car or a Bible on the, on the dash, they wouldn't even deal with them. Why? Because some of them use that to who do somebody. No, we just need to be straight up and let our yes be yes and our no be no and serve Christ with gladness in our heart and it'll all work out. Amen. And he, Jesus did not appreciate the way they were trying to conduct business and he dealt with it. You can now, read down to 22. <laughs> Sorry. Now in the morning, as he returned to the city, he was hungry and seeing a fig tree by the road, he came to it and found nothing on it but leaves and said to it, let no fruit grow on you ever again. Immediately the fig tree withered away. And when the disciples saw it, they marveled saying, how did the fig tree wither away so soon? So Jesus answered and said to them, assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what was done to the fig tree, but also if you say to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, it will be done. And whatever things you ask in prayer, believing you will receive. Wow. So, so what's Jesus dealing with? I mean, it, it seems a little unorthodox that he's walking down the road and just curses a fig tree. But he's doing two things. He's teaching his disciples by illustrated parable. He's illustrating something that have been, has been taught for years. It taught the disciples something. you got to realize the people that's walking with him is going to be part of the birthing of the church, and they've got to know. So Jesus used this as an example. What's the first thing he's teaching? Don't try to be something you're not. The fig tree is a pronouncement of how bad Jesus hated man-made religion that left God out of the equation. No fruit. Me and Keith didn't talk about this morning, but I'm glad he shared what he did. Why? Because when we don't do what the Word says, we end up fruitless. When we do what God says, we'll bear fruit and much fruit. He's teaching them that. He says, I don't have no time for these religious people. They've turned the the house into a den of thieves. He'll deal with it over and over in the gospel already has. He said, they clean up the outside. They look polished. They look good. But on the inside, they're full of dead man's bones. See, it's not about how you look, where you go, any of that. It's about the Jesus in your heart. What, what's, what's God doing in your heart? And then when you speak that out. Now, the other lesson that he taught us is you can have whatever you believe you'll receive. Amen. This is called more division in the... I don't know why. Well, I do too. It's the devil. People have been divided over verses like this for years because the first thing the devil will tell them is, yeah, but you can't have anything. Partial truth. You can't have anything. 
You can only have what you believe you receive. You can't fully believe unless it's in Scripture as a Christian. You can't remove doubt in your heart by saying, I don't doubt, I don't doubt, I don't doubt. No. To remove unbelief, you have to refill with belief. There is no shortcut to that. The people that have tried to take shortcuts is the ones that end up giving faith a bad name. Years ago, years ago, some of you will remember this. There was a whole group of people, name it and claim it, blab it and grab it. What? They were just saying things, believing they received, but they didn't know what God said. They were giving God their list, some of it not even holy. <laughs> See, God still don't like covetousness. If I go out in the parking lot and I see the nicest new car out there and I begin to covet that car, truck, whatever, it's still covetous. It's still wrong. But if God says to me today, go down to, go, you need to go look for a vehicle. It's time. And he usually has to tell me that because I'll wear the wheels off of one. I just don't think it's a good investment. I'm sorry. I'm not talking about you buying one. I'm just saying to me, they... Anyway, I like driving a new one. I just don't like the depreciation of it. God will tell me, go get one. And usually, I mean, I feel strongly that it's time. You know, transmission's out or something. But <laughs> I didn't say how I found out I needed to go. Uh, no, it's maybe not that bad. It has been, though. But anyway, <laughs> I get God's list. Why? Because... The last vehicle I purchased, the, the truck, my wife reminded me, I thought you didn't buy new vehicles. But it was a time when the new vehicle was cheaper than the used one sitting in the lot. And the Lord knew that. He knew where and when to send me. What? It's his list. I could have got my eye on the wrong one and bought the wrong one. And guess what? No big deal. He still loves me still forgives me, still walk with him. Jesus is saying, whatever you believe, you'll receive. He said, if you'll say, if you'll say to that mountain, be removed, I'll remove it. What, what mountain's in your way? Could be a relationship, could be a finance, could be health, could, could be anything. A job. I was just having a conversation before church with someone about how hard it seems for people to actually speak healing, speak prosperity. Why? Because inside of us, we feel like we're saying something false. But here's the only antidote, the only prescription for that is we just need to know what he said and repeat that. Because yeah. that's, how, that's how it works. Mark eleven twenty two. have faith in God. Whatever you say, believing you'll receive. If you speak to the mountain, it'll move. He didn't say how long it would take to move it. He, did, he, didn't, he, didn't, he didn't give any indication. He just assured us that it will. How many of you know what I'm talking about? There's been things that you believed for, for for a long time, but they finally came to pass. You envisioned something different for your life. You envision, and here's what we talked a little bit about this yesterday. You and I need to envision the mountain out of the way. When you see a vision for your life, remove the mountain there first. Yeah. Get, find out what God said and then begin to speak that. I am. When I first come to the kingdom, I didn't even know this teaching, but God did. <laughs> when I came into the kingdom, I was so condemned, I couldn't hardly look you in the eye, and that's just not who I am. That's, that wasn't who I was at all. I was so ashamed. The Bible says the Holy Spirit will bring all things to your remembrance. When I got saved, here's what he brought to my remembrance, how rotten I was. You say, oh, do you really believe that? Yeah, because see, you, know, you need to know you need a Savior in order to receive one. The hardest people to ever reach is the ones that think they're okay, and they're not. But when I received all the things and the, the Lord reminded me of all the things I'd done, I'm hit with this blanket of condemnation. And so what did I do? I looked in the mirror every day and said, I, there is no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. I'm in Christ Jesus. It's gone. The old man has passed away. Behold, here stands the new one. 
Did I feel the new one? No, not initially. Did I feel the no condemnation? No. But what happened was I kept confessing that mountain moved. That mountain moved. And if that, if that mountain ever tries to get back up, we have a quick talk in the mirror and we move right on. Why? Because I know what the word says. I, I, that song we sing, cause I'm saved. I know I'm saved. Amen. When you know you're saved, don't you buy into the lies of the enemy that you're less than. You ain't less than nothing and you ain't better than nobody. But who he is and who you are in him makes all the difference. Amen. I love that the movie, the one part in there, and I won't give away the movie, but I love the fact that they actually took a movie and said, uh, he said, that old man that done all this shameful stuff died and a new one came back to life. That's what happens in our born-again experience. That's why we do it with water baptism. We show that the old man goes in the grave and the new man comes out of the water. And when he does, he's different. She's different. Amen? I got a little excited there. So how do we get rid of unbelief? See, you don't need more faith. Quit praying that if you're praying that. Christians have been praying that for years. I, I see it posted all the time. But you don't find it in Scripture. What you find in Scripture is God dealt to every man a measure, woman a me- measure of faith. What did the disciples, the one that walks the closest with him, what did they say? Lord, help us with our unbelief. How do you get rid of unbelief? You put in believing. Going way back, so I'm telling my age here, when computers first started hitting the scene, you put the good stuff in, you get the good stuff out. That was the slogan uh, of one of the companies. You put the good stuff in, you get the good stuff out. The computer's only going to spit out what's put in it. Well, guess what? The greatest computer ever invented was your brain, your mind. Still re- so remarkable. Can, you can walk in a room tomorrow and somebody can be cooking something and immediately you go back to when you're six years old and mom was cooking it. Have you ever done that? You can walk, you can smell something, you're like, wow. You can hear something. Uh, somebody had just posted this. You can hear a song that you heard when you were a teenager and all of a sudden you go back riding in that car when you heard the song. Your mind can recall so much information. God wants us to use our mind with our heart, what we believe in our heart, to speak out what we know to be true, and the mountain will move. That's how you take care of unbelief. It's very simple. I didn't say it was easy. Why? Because you've got an enemy. You've got enemy inside of you. A lot of times it says, no, that's not right. That's foolish. That's foolish. I remember the first time me and Bibi laid hands on our check, but we were in, we were not in a good financial place. We had both been divorced. Now we're remarried, and we didn't bring nothing to the table. Well, very little. And we're trying to make it and raise a family. And Pastor Whitfield you said he did, it was a word from God. He said you need to go home, lay your hands on the checkbook. That's your mountain, and you need to speak what it's supposed to look like. And I'll be honest with you, I thought that's a little weird. a little weird talking to a checkbook then it began to dawn on me that checkbook had been talking to me it had been telling me how broke I was yeah things will talk to you if you don't believe it go on a diet today that's probably the easiest one go on a diet that oatmeal cookie is going to talk to you or whatever your favorite is that Snickers bar <laughs> yeah Oreos, there you go, yeah, with milk. (laughs) I don't like milk, but they say that's a thing. Uh, But anyway, talk to what's talking to you. Now, did, did our finances heal immediately? No, but I tell you what, God began to speak to us. Me first. Told me to put the credit card up. I'm like, he is just no fun at all. That's just, that's just mean, God. I, I'm the spender in our family, in case you was wondering. And I don't mean this derogatory f- towards any of you ladies, but I'm just telling you what my wife said, so you can uh, talk to her. She said, you like to shop and spend money more than any woman I've ever met. I do. I like this. I've gotten better. But here's the point. 
I put that credit card up and almost as quick as I put it up, my finances started lining up. What was the credit card? A word from God. When God speaks to you, get the unbelief out. You start speaking to that mountain. Just do whatever he says. Go tell them I need the donkey, the colt. Let's go back to that. You go tell them I need the donkey. They ain't going to say nothing. If they do, just tell them I have need of it. If people question you, just tell them God has need of you doing this. That settles it. When God gives you a word, you don't need my approval for it. You don't need your neighbor's approval. You need to stand on it and believe it. Amen? Go ahead, Pastor Sheila. Let's go down to verse 27, and then we're going to stop, I think. Now, when he came into the temple, the chief priest and the elders of the people confronted him as he was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? But Jesus answered and said to them, I also will ask you one thing, which if you tell me, I likewise will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, where was it from? From heaven or from men? And they reasoned among themselves, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say to us, Why then did you not believe him? But if we say from men, we fear the multitude, for all count John as a prophet. So they answered Jesus and said, We do not know. And he said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. <laughs> Don't you love Jesus? Let me tell you about my Jesus. He can't be trapped. And neither can you, and neither can I, if we'll listen. And here's how you know when God's saying it. You're shocked. I've said things to people. I've taught things that came out of my mouth that I wanted to run around the room because it was the first time I heard it. And I knew it, my intellect was not there. It was a word from God. Jesus knew how to deal with them. He basically just turned the tables on them. He knew how they felt about John. They seen him, esteemed him as a prophet. His dad was the high priest. He knew, and he says, okay, you want to play that game? We'll play. Answering a question with another question. I've said this many times in this pulpit. If you own a business or you lead people, you need above everything you do, you need to learn how to be someone who knows how to ask good questions. Not for question's sakes, but for, for the idea that you're obtaining information from another human being that you value what they have to say. The greatest men I've ever served under, whether it be in the, in the world or in the church, has been those that asked me what I thought. Why? Because immediately you recognize you're part of the, the equation. Jesus brought them into his world and saying, look, where did, you, where did John's authority come from? <laughs> they knew either way they answered, they were, he, turned it, he turned the tables. How does that apply to you? Don't let people trap you. Don't let people make you submit to their thinking. This is what happened to the church. This is why some church, some churches in America have went plumb woke. Why? Because they've let people trap them into what they believe. Listen, I, I have no problem with what anybody believes. That's them and that's between them and God. But I have a huge problem when they tell me what I should believe when it's not in the Scripture. I just can't do that. To, to me, that takes away, forget Christianity, Christianity just for a moment. That takes away everything I believe as a human being. I learned years ago in business that if you ain't your own man, you're going to be somebody else's man. If you don't have your own vision, guess what? They'll give you one, tell, it, tell you it's yours. I've been down that road. I'm not interested. Why? Because God made us individuals. And then when we believe the scripture, we don't need somebody to... I, I grew up in a generation where people were okay with you believing something different. I don't understand how we got so far away from that. I don't follow you around and find out what ice cream you like. I personally like chocolate chip the best. But I'm not about to tell you wrong if you like vanilla. 
I'm not, I'm not going to go downtown to a secular organization and tell them how to run it just because I have an opinion. If I do business with them and I don't like the way they run it, I'll quit doing business with them. Same thing in the church. If, if people don't like what you're preaching or teaching, that, I don't mean that please don't misunderstand me as I mean this ugly because I don't. But we're free will. We, we can get up and walk out. We don't have to come back. One other thing, let me say this. We don't never judge it based on one thing that was said because if you'd done that, you'd never eat at another restaurant. You'd never do business with anybody. How many of you have ever had a bad experience at a restaurant you went back to? We all have. I'm not talking about a bad experience. I'm not talking about me saying something that you didn't like the way I said it. I'm talking about over and over contradicting what the Word says. I want to know what the Word says. It's, that's why we do this. Amen? Let's quit. I mean, if you remember the old movie, Forrest Gump, and that's all I got to say about that. <laughs> Amen? Let me recap one thing, though. Don't forget to speak to your mountain. Get your list from the Lord. What's God saying to you? Ask yourself that question often. You say, well, I don't have an answer. That's okay. Keep asking. What's God saying to me? In this season, because seasons are so valuable, that'll definitely be one of the topics we readdress in 2024. The, as the older I get, the more important I understand seasons. I don't feel or think about things the way I did when I was 30. Sometimes I forget and I do things thinking I am still 30, and then my body reminds me. Can I get a witness? Amen. Yeah, but, but I, inside, I know things have changed. Ask God what he's saying to you in this season. The reason Bibi's not here this morning, she'll be here at 10 o'clock or a little after, is we have the grand, two of the grandkids this week, a weekend, and she said, I don't really want to get them up that early and, and be at both services, so I'm going to come to the second one. And I told her if she loved Jesus, she'd be at this one. But <laughs> I'm picking. I'm picking. <laughs> so anyway, that's, we're in a different season. We're not raising our kids and knocking out things like we used to do, and we're not concerned with certain things like we were when the kids were at home. Why do people have this, what do they call it, uh, empty nest syndrome? Because they didn't think about the season was coming. They didn't get God's list. What does God want me to do in this? Oh, I got all this free time, and he's getting on my nerves. <laughs> and all the ladies said... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, BB looks at me and we have this code word. She'll say, ta-da, which means you're around too much. <laughs> ta-da, <laughs> there you are again. Because <laughs> I do a lot of office work at home and so does she and it's like, <laughs> hallelujah, different season. Recognize your season, speak to your season. Ask God what he's saying to you. Believe you receive when you say it, and you'll have it. Amen? Or as we said last weekend, find your cord, and it'll please the Lord. That movie he was talking about, I had no idea Phil Robertson had a chance at a whole